Welcome to the evening services of the Benton Church of Christ. It's uh, finally starting to get closer and closer to normal for us. We are finally reaching that point where we're starting to have more of our services. Of course, this is a virtual service. Just the, uh, I guess, what would you say, the essential staff is here, which all the staff is essential, but you got Freddie and Mike working up top and got Philip working on the radio station so that you can see us, but hopefully in about the next two or three weeks, we can start having regular Sunday evening services as well. That's what we're working our way toward. So we start with our announcements. Sympathy is expressed to the family of Nathan Pirtle. His grandmother, Pat Pirtle, passed away this last week, and the funeral was last week. Also in our prayers, please remember George Taylor, Alec Jones, Webb Caldwell, Ruby Nelson, Larry Farmer, and Sylvia McCarty, and all those who are homebound and elderly. We are tickled to announce that Donna Edwards, uh, she's been a member of the church for a long time over at South Marshall. Uh, She has um, told us that she would like to be identified as a member of our congregation, and we are absolutely tickled to have Donna. She has been married to the late Brent Edwards. Also, we would like to express a special birthday to Mabel Keith. She turned 94 years young, and that was this past Friday. If I'm not mistaken, both Kelvin and Mabel are our oldest members, although you wouldn't know it by looking at them. This Wednesday night, Lord willing, we'll have Dustin Campbell come speak for us on our summer series. And so be sure to be here if you can at 6.30 or watch on live stream on uh, Facebook or on the radio. He did a great job last year, and we're looking forward to him being here this year as well. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 will be where our lesson is from tonight. Tonight's lesson is going to talk about some things which we don't always talk about, and that is the existence of God. Usually in the church, it appears, Mark 10, 18 is where we're headed, usually in the church, we kind of have a, um, just an assumption that God exists. And so we raise our children up in the church, and we tell them, hey, there is a God, um, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. There is the Lord's church. Here's the verses which tell you what the church should look like and how the church should operate. Many times, if we do a good job, we teach our kids doctrine and things such as that. But then they'll go to, through high school. And sometimes in their science classes, their science teachers, as they're teaching Darwinian evolution, will make the mention, you don't, you don't really have to believe in God. And oftentimes, when we send our kids away from home to state schools, as they go through their biology classes and their philosophy classes, they hear a lot of arguments going towards uh, atheism or going against this idea of theism, that there is a God, and if that there is a God, the God is named Yahweh or Jehovah. And so it's interesting to me that oftentimes in the Lord's church, we lose our kids from the faith when they begin to go off and they begin to have to answer for their faith, why they believe what they do. And part of that is because we always just assume God exists. Sometimes maybe it's a difficult conversation to go through apologetics, which is an idea of a defense of God, talking about how you and I can truly know that God exists. That's an important thing for us to know and to understand. And so I want to, for this week and maybe a few additional weeks, to look at this idea of can we know? Can we teach our children for certain that there is a God? That's an important thing for each and every one of us to understand. And so let's go to our next slide as we think about this idea of does God exist? Oftentimes when we're talking about this, we go to this idea of design demands a designer. In other words, there must be a God because of the absolute design of creation. Now, as we look at this, some passages in the Bible we'd use as foundation or backup would be Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, which talks about the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen by, (coughs) excuse me, the things, (coughs) the things of this creation. In other words, as Paul is introducing Jesus and introducing the gospel to the people there, He makes a mention in chapter 1 and verse 20 that they know God exists and who God is by looking at the world that's around. 
Uh, Psalm chapter 19 and verse 1 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows us his handiwork. In other words, as you and I look around the world, we know that God exists because of everything that's around. Oftentimes, when we're looking at this, we'll talk about the solar system. As we have the summer solstice, which has happened just recently, we see the different movements in the earth and its orbit around the sun. We see the work of the moon and we see the work of all the planets and how each one of them work in concert to make this planet, planet earth, be exactly perfect for mankind. As you and I look at all the galaxies which are around, we see these galaxies and hundreds of billions of stars and planets going around those stars, and yet we have yet to find one that's just like the earth. This world is perfectly created, not by chance, but by a designer. If you want to leave the macro side and go to the micro side, we can go all the way down to the functioning of every single particle and the atoms which are inside. And as you look at the idea of the neutrons and the protons and the electrons, and you see how they work together and how they form the different chemical equations that make life possible, you see that designer, which is absolutely right there. When you look at the design of our body, you can look into the eye, and the eye is an excellent example because there's no way when you get down to it that you can explain going by partial steps, going by an evolutionary biology theory, that an eye would be created in the way in which it was. It's just too large of a step and too much of a complex situation for it to happen by chance. And so design demands a designer. And so oftentimes in the Lord's Church, we go through and we become scientists for a little bit, and we begin talking about these sort of things, how as you look at the species, as you look at this world, as you look at the universe, as you look at biology and at chemistry and all those sort of things, you see the fingerprint of a designer, and that designer is God. Once again, going right back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. But for this lesson, I'd like for us to go somewhere else as we talk about can we know that there is a God? And that's where we come to Mark chapter 10 and verse 18. Because in Mark chapter 10, verse 18, the rich young ruler comes before Jesus. And he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, verse 18 strikes us as strange because what Jesus responds with is this. He says, don't call me good. No one is good but God. In other words, only God can set the standard. Only God can define goodness. This rich young ruler on the outside had looked faithful. He had looked religious. He had looked righteous. He had followed all of the Ten Commandments, as he said, and yet he still lacked some things because his heart was not in the right place. And so Jesus correctly tells him that only God can see the heart and only God can show him what he needed to do. And so as Jesus met this man and talked with this man, we see that he loved him and he told him what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. It was more than just being faithful. He needed to sell all that he had and give it to the poor. Now remember that passage because that's going to become very important. No one is good except God. Tonight we're going to discuss the moral argument for the existence of God. As we go to our next slide, we see some examples of people who have existed in our past. And what I want us to do is I want us to examine these people and what they stood for and what they accomplished. And as we look at this idea of what the naturalist teaches, we're going to see the lack of a moral basis for Darwinian theory, for Darwin's theory. The first person we're going to study was going to be Francis Galton. He is a cousin, if you will, of Charles Darwin. And as Francis Galton was reading through some of Charles uh, Darwin's materials, in 1883, he came upon some ideas. He noticed where Charles Darwin had gone to the Galapagos Islands, how he had done many studies with breeds of cattle and breeds of horses there upon the, the uh, English islands. And as he studied that and saw the idea of natural selection and saw the idea of improving species as they came along, he invented a word. That word is eugenics. Now, Francis Galton also invented many other things. He invented meteorology. He invented weather maps, things such as that. But he's most known 
for this idea of eugenics. Now, what eugenics means is it's the idea of breeding people the same way you would cattle or the same way you would any other animal which is around. For example, at my home, we have, uh, you could call them dash hounds. I call them weenie dogs. They're both purebred weenie dogs. What's happened is for this generation and all generations past, people have examined these animals and made sure only the best genetics go from generation to generation to generation. Those of you who have worked on a farm know this quite a bit as you look at cattle. Whether you're looking at Charlay, whether you're looking at Hereford, whether you're looking at Angus, no matter what cow you're looking at, what you're doing as you breed these cattle and as you work with them through generations is you're trying to improve the stock that you have. And as you work on that stock, maybe it's to produce dairy, maybe it's to produce meat. As you work on that stock, each generation you try to improve it and you try to make that next generation to be better. And so Francis Galton, as he looked at this idea of applying this to the past and applying this to the natural world, he came up with the idea of the philosophy of you could do this with people. And therefore, he had many different ideas, which seem strange to us in today's world, of making sure that royalty and making sure that the Lord class there in England would uh, intermarry with themselves and not with the commoners to try to improve this idea of a genealogical tree, to try to improve certain traits which existed in man. Now, you and I today see that, and we absolutely realize just how terrible of an idea that is and how horrible it is. Fifty years later, you see a man named Adolf Hitler. This man comes to power in a destroyed country, Germany. And as he gets past the Weimar uh, government, he begins to teach many different ideas which are very similar to Francis Galton. He has an idea about an Aryan race, and you've studied in history, and you've studied in different places to see what this definition of his race would be. He, blonde hair, blue eyed, he saw them as a master race. In his eyes, in his mind, and Francis Galton's mind as well, there was a higher IQ, there was a higher learning quote, and there was a higher learning ability which was there. And so he wanted to create out, out of the German people, out of the Caucasian race there, a master race which would cover that area of the world and eventually would rule over all the other races. And so therefore they had the idea of cleaning out much land so that this race could enter, this race could grow and become stronger and stronger. In addition to that, he destroyed many other races. We've read about the Holocaust in which 18 million people died because of Hitler's idea. Now, when you begin to think about how many 18 million people would be over the course of 10 years, recognize that the population of Kentucky is 4.2 million. And so anywhere between 13 and 18 and 22 million, depending on who you ask, people were put to death because of Hitler's idea concerning eugenics. Now, you bring that to our side of the world, and you begin looking in the modern history of the United States, you meet a lady named Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger had very similar ideas. And as she began to write and as she began to think, she was a self-thinker, a very independent lady. And she had this belief that we need to do what we can to put people who are in difficult situations to not make their situation worse by having more children. Her idea of, of healing poverty in this country was to reduce and eventually eliminate certain populations. And so she was very popular and gave many speeches to the Ku Klux Klan, to different groups like that, because she saw certain races as being impoverished and certain races as having great difficulty ever being able to reach the level of other people in the U.S. And so she began, in her idea of eugenics, to teach about birth control and to begin to distribute birth control and to make birth control legal. And as she went on with that, she founded Planned Parenthood. But Planned Parenthood was never in the richer parts of town. It was always located in the parts of town and the places where she thought it would be more effective looking from her eugenic background. Now, as we look at these three people, and we could look at many more, 
Francis Galton, Adolf Hitler, Margaret Sandler. We see a logical progression to Darwinian theory. As you and I listen in our schools and we see our teacher or professor begin to teach about Darwin, it begins with a very simple thing. What about these birds? Would these birds, if they had a bigger bill on this island, be able to eat better than they would if they had a small bill? Well, of course, the bigger bill would be able to be more successful, and there they would go. What about this fish? If a fish had an ability to squirm and to work on land, could that give it an advantage as far as it goes? And you start there in a very open, simple way, but then it progresses. And it becomes something which becomes very dangerous and leads to a certain section and leads us to a certain place. And it becomes very detrimental to humankind and the thought process that we are created in the image of God. Now, why would we talk about such negative things? Because it's necessary in our world. In the last census, and it's much more now than it was before, as a matter of fact, not even the last census, in 2015, it was stated by the Census Bureau that 25%, one-fourth of people in the United States today register themselves as what's called nuns. Not N-U-N-S, the people who stay in the convent, N-O-N-E-S. In other words, when the census and the different questions come to them, they say, I don't belong to a church. I don't belong to a religious philosophy. None of the above is what matches me. Now, when you begin to ask them a little bit more seriously certain questions, 8% of all people openly profess atheism. That is, that they believe that they can certainly say there is no God. Much of that is due to our lack of teaching. Much of that is due to Christians being afraid to stand up for truth and Christians being willing to say those things that are right. In the eyes of many people, those who preach from a pulpit are considered to be rubes. They're considered to be common. They're considered to be ignorant. In the eyes of many people, folks who are in a schoolhouse are considered to be highly, highly, highly intelligent. And oftentimes they are. But we need to be careful where we find our standards. We need to be careful when we begin to stereotype religious people and we begin to say, well, you know, those Christians, those people who believe in the Bible, they must not be very smart. They must not be very intelligent. Because that belief of atheism, that belief of being a nun, none of the above, none registered, leads you to a very difficult place. Let's go ahead and go to our next slide. Now, this is a very difficult slide for us to go over, but it's an important one for us to consider. When you look at Adolf Hitler, when you look at Charles Galton, when you look at Margaret Sangler, can you say that they're evil? Can you say that they're wrong? Can you say that they're a detriment to society? And if you can, here's my question. Why? What is your standard to say that Adolf Hitler is an evil man? Going back to the teachings of Charles Darwin and going back to the teachings of true atheism, of true natural selection, the goal of every generation is nothing more than passing down its genes to the next generation. The goal of every generation is nothing more than giving your offspring the best chance and therefore diminishing the best chance of all of competing offspring. You see, when you're working with cattle, you want to improve the odds that your Hereford, that your Angus, that your Charlet cattle, the cattle that produce the most and bring back the most money, you want to make sure that they are successful. And if you're working on that, you're going to cull from your herd, at least keep them from reproduction, anything that does not improve the bottom line. 
Anything that does not improve the next generation. Now, that's true of us as we look at our gardens and the plants that we have. That's true of us as we look at our cattle, as we look at our dogs, as we look at our animals. That's true of us as we look at our harvesting and our crops and everything such as that. But if you and I, as people, are no different than a dog, than a cow, than a tomato plant, what standard can you say that eugenics, that rape, and murder are wrong? Because from a Darwinian theory, all you need to do is give your offspring the best chance. You're working to try to increase your offspring and decrease everyone else. In Hitler's mindset, he wanted to create a homeland for his master race, and to do so, he needed to eliminate everyone else. Darwinian theory says that's the highest point. And Margaret Sanger's philosophy in Planned Parenthood, make it easy for a mother to destroy her baby so that she will not be in poverty, so that she will be more successful. Make it easy for this person who is undesirable, who cannot afford this child, make, that this child may be inconvenient, make it easy for that child to be destroyed. That way society will end up being better off in the next generation. If you believe in God, you can openly say that's evil. But if you don't believe in God... You can not define evil. Because who am I to put my morality on top of a person on the other side of the world, such as Hitler? Who am I to say that Mao Zedong, that, that Joseph Stalin is wrong, even though they killed more people than Hitler did? Because they were working to improve their society. They are working to improve the next generation. They were practicing the idea of eugenics. They were practicing this idea of natural selection. Here's the point. These things are condemned because the inherent nobility and value of people. When you believe in God, you will notice chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of Genesis lets us know that we are created in the image of God. In Galatians 3, in verse 27 and 28, we see there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. In Acts chapter 10, in verse 34, we see truly God is, does not show partiality with any people. But he understands that every single person has value and can come to him. Here is why it's important to believe in God. It gives purpose to life. Without God and without a standard, there is no purpose to life. I have no right to say that Hitler is evil. I have no right to fight against Planned Parenthood and abortion because I cannot say it's evil. Because from Sangler's standpoint, from Hitler's standpoint, what they were doing was good, was noble, and was important. But God gives us a standard. And that standard is what we follow when you and I study Scripture. Notice some passages which we can read. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 tells us there is a way that seems right to man, but that way shall lead us unto death. Some people have different philosophies than I do. Some people have different mindsets than I do. Some people have different cultural baggage than I do. But each one of us, if we are left to ourselves and we are allowed to create our own moral order, each one of us will find a world that leads to death. It's God that leads us to eternal life. It's God that we must follow. Paul covers this in Acts chapter 17. Go ahead, if you've got your Bibles with you, turn to Acts 17. I want us to notice a passage. This is Paul talking to the great philosophers of his day, the Epicureans who were there. And the Epicureans had a philosophy that you only live upon this earth for a while, 
Death is coming. When death comes, it's all over. And so you had better enjoy yourself. Uh, the philosophy is repeated over in Colossians. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Those people, those philosophers were sitting there on the Areopagus, on, uh, on the platform on Mars Hill in which people would argue every day. Also there were the Stoics. The Stoics were uh, founded by a man named Gino. Uh, the word stoa means a porch. That's where he taught every single day. He likewise taught that the end of the world is coming. And so each and every one of us needs to brace and be ready for this world, whatever it brings, and stand fast because we cannot control the world that's around us. Both of these people were making fun of Christians. They were making fun of Paul. And so they invited him to come and they invited him to speak. And so as we go to that sermon found in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 26, read with me if you will. Acts 17, beginning in verse 26. Paul says here, And he made one man from every nation of mankind to live upon the face of this earth, having allotted the determined times and periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from any one of us. For in him we live, we move, and we have our every being. And even some of your own poets have said, For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art or imagination of man. These times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now God calls all men everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day upon which he shall judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance by raising him from the dead. Notice with me, if you will, the implications of that passage we just read. Every one of us is created in the image of God. We are God's offspring. You'll notice the second point in what Paul says here. Every one of us have a God spark, if you will, within us. There is a hunger. There is a knowledge. There is a conscience of what is right. We can't always explain why that morality is there, but it's there. We can't always explain what the basis of it is, but it's there. And as we begin to explore within ourselves, we realize that God exists. And as Paul says, we begin to grope, search in the darkness for this God. You go to almost every culture upon this world, they will tell you that rape is wrong. Now, many cultures are not Christian, and they cannot fully explain why it's wrong, but there is an innate nature of man which tells you that it is. If we're created by natural selection, such as the Darwinian model says, that innate spark would not be there. On almost every culture in this world, even to the very beginning with Cain and Abel, every culture will tell you murder is wrong. They will not always have a basis for why it's wrong. They can't always explain why it's wrong. But there's an innate spark in every one of us that explains to us it's wrong. And as we begin to ask ourselves why, it creates that groping, that thought process, that searching into blindness for God, for God's existence and who God is. Now, this conscience can be seared as with a hot iron. And Hitler was able to kill millions upon millions of people because he neglected the thought that they were made in the image of God and he thought they were no different than animals. He eliminated that spark within him and burnt that conscience through. Sanger was willing to kill thousands, if you look even to today, millions of children through abortion and Planned Parenthood by burning the conscience. By fighting for what she believed in, she overcame that God spark, which is there. As you and I go through the prisons... We'll see many people who have burned their conscience who no longer see the difference between right and wrong. But in the vast majority of us, you'll see that which is there. 
That spark does not show up by natural selection. If our ultimate goal, as Charles Darwin would say, and even neo-Darwin theory would say, if our only goal is to spread our seed, to spread our genes to the next generation, that would be a detriment. And that would cause us to be extinct. It would have already been taken out of our genome, of our, of our identity, so that we could continue to go on. Now, if you study these things very much, and you begin reading works by um, atheists, um, Dawkins, who has already passed, Pendulet, uh, he's not passed yet, he's still alive, they oftentimes will struggle with this thought process, which is here, and with this thing. And what they'll say is, well, the reason why murder is wrong, the reason why rape is wrong, the reason why eugenics is wrong is because mankind now works as a superorganism. We realize society is the best way to pass our genes on to the next generation. Instead of looking at ourselves as individuals, we look at ourselves as a society, and that's the reason why we see these things as wrong. But that does not work according to the theory of natural selection. Because each one of us has a drive to bring our generation to the next generation. And we see this God spark within each and every one of us. As Paul would say later in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, we see inherently that one day every knee shall bow before God and every tongue shall confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, as you and I look around in ourselves, we see that there is a standard that goes beyond my opinion, a standard which goes beyond your opinion, beyond any other person's opinion. That's found even in the writings of our country. You see, as you read the Declaration of Independence, as you read our Constitution, we see that we are given God-given rights. We are created in the image of God with certain self-evident rights. We're created in the image of God. God is our standard. Isaiah 55, look in verse 8 and 9, God, God will tell Isaiah, telling the Israelites, he'll say, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As the skies are higher than the mountains, so also are my thoughts above your thoughts. What God is telling the Israelite nation at this time is, even though they had different opinions, even though they were following a different law than God's law, God says we will all be found accountable to him. Because God is the standard. God is the one that each and every one of us must follow at every opportunity. John is very clear upon this as you go through his gospel, as he talks about this word, truth. Notice with me if you'll go through the book very quickly. John chapter 1 and verse 17, For the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 14, and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In John 17, 17, Jesus says, praying to God, sanctify them, Lord, by your truth, for your word is truth. In John's irony, in 1836 of the gospel, Pilate will look at Jesus and he'll say, what is truth? Because instead of following the standard of what is right and what is truth, Paul went with the crowd in order to save himself. He went against the entire book of John, and John shows how this man was destroyed because of it. Why does John put that through his entire gospel, this idea of truth? God's standard. It's a standard that each and every one of us must follow. It's why you and I can say that Hitler was wrong, why you and I can say Mao was wrong, why you and I could say Castro was wrong. Because we have a standard to show us that that's the case. And so what does the standard say about us? First and foremost is this. The standard teaches us that all people are worthy of respect 
and worthy of love. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, we see that, uh, that love is not deserved. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The godly gave himself for the ungodly. When we begin reading through Luke chapter 15, we see Jesus spending time with sinners and tax collectors and harlots. Why? Because all people are worthy of love and respect. God's standard teaches us exactly how it is that we should live and how it is we should treat our fellow man. A second lesson that we learn is that any deviation from God demands repentance. We oftentimes will speak of this deviation by a word that's been brought into the English language. And that word is sin. When you go to the Old English, sin actually was an archery term. Any time a man with a long bow would shoot his bow and he would miss the target, it was sin. It did not go true to that target. That language is brought into the King James Bible and eventually into our modern Bible to explain what sin is. Sin is any deviation from the target. Now, if you have a French man charging you and you're an English archer, you can miss that man by three inches or miss that man by a mile. It doesn't matter. Either way, you're going to die because you missed your target. In the same way, in the Lord's church, you can miss it by an inch or you can miss it by a mile. But if you're not found perfect in Christ, you're lost. Romans 3 and verse 23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3 tells us that these uncertain times that we live in should remind us to repent. Acts 17 and verse 31, Paul tells those same people on Mars Hill, Truly these times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now God calls all men everywhere to repent to turn away from missing, to turn away from sin, and to live in the way in which God has called us to live. As we study this world, we see so much evil. As we look around in our world, we see covetousness and we see pride. We see people which slander one another. And we see a world that no matter how hard it tries, cannot save itself. The only way in which we find salvation is through Jesus Christ. Well, how do you come to Jesus Christ? You find out about him through the standard. While this earth and while moral reasoning shows us that God exists and that God is good, you find out about God through his word. This is how he communicates with us. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, Now faith comes by hearing in hearing by the Word of God. As we learn God's Word, we'll change our life. We'll repent, no longer living selfishly, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may see that which is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of the Father. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. As we've changed our life, we'll grow in faith, for without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek after Him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And then when we are baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 and verse 38, to wash our sins away, Acts 22, 16, to be joined to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4, will be added to the body of Christ, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. When that happens, when you're added to the body of Christ, you stand in Jesus. Your sins are washed away by his sacrifice. You are now a child of God, recognized in white robes to God, and ready for judgment as long as you remain faithful. That's the invitation that we call everyone to. This sad world, 25% of our population refuses to come to any church of any sort. 
7% proudly stand up and shake their fists to the earth and believe that there is no God. But this world shows us that God exists. Our minds tell us that God exists. And the scriptures implore us to make ourselves right with God. Now, at the end of every lesson, we have a time of invitation. And if you need to obey the gospel of Christ through baptism, or if you need personal prayer, I invite you to call me. My number is 270-703-1134. And you can call me or call any person who is listed up there on that board. And we will do what we can to help meet your spiritual needs. We're saved in Christ and we want to help other people as well. It's a great opportunity for us to do what God would want us to do. For as Peter said in Acts 2, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as our Lord God will call. Thank you very much for the time we've had together.